Okay. Every year people ask me what they should get their swimmer for Christmas. And I always tell them the same thing. Get a pair of drag socks made by Aquavolo. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for any swimmer. Honestly, there's no simpler training tool to build power in the water than a pair of drag socks. Go to aquavolo.com and use the code Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout and save 10%. The offer's good only through November, so order now. Um, all right, Sabir Muhammad, how you doing, man? Hey, hey, thanks for having me on the, uh, inside the, uh, the mind of Brett Hawk. Is that the name of the show? <laughs> Pretty close. I'm, I'm getting inside <laughs> your mind. Can't get in mine. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, man? Where are you? Where are you coming from? Uh, I'm coming, coming from you from Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. You, you've been living there for a while now, huh? That's right. It's my hometown uh you know i've uh i've lived in a lot of places um went to school on the west coast lived in hawaii for a bit miami florida keys new york la uh and i just keep coming home to atlanta <laughs> it's a good spot it's, it's great here well listen man you got a great story beautiful story but i, I don't know it all so we're going to try and get into it a little bit um, I know the, I know the, I know the Sabir from when he swam at Stanford on, I don't know too much about you before that. So let's kind of, right. let's kind of give me some of that action, man. Like what, how oh, yeah. did you, how did you even get into swimming? Oh, uh, great. Yeah. Love to tell you. So, uh, my first exposure with the sport of swimming was in near drowning, like many of my peers. Mm. Uh, my parents went to, uh, a family reunion. And uh, there was a, a river there and I just ran and dove in it. <clears throat> I was about, I don't know, call it three at the time. I ran and dove in the river and uh, did not know how to swim, like not a lick. And uh, my dad dove in after me, saved me, brought me to the shore. And um, after that, like the entire family was there, like extended family, everybody, everybody came up to my mom. They're like, Hey, you've got to put him in swimming lessons, like aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmas, like play cousins, everybody. And so, um, my mom put me in lessons at this place called Pittman park, uh, here in, uh, Southwest Atlanta. And, uh, you know, she would like gather up a bunch of her friends, kids, take us to the pool. I learned to swim. Uh, that summer and um, you know fast forward a couple years my mom actually started working at the pool mm. and uh, I would go she was a locker room attendant so she would like clean the locker rooms the kids you know people hand her the baskets put the baskets away and all that <clears throat> so I would go uh, with her after school and I just kind of like sit and do my homework and like um, while she worked and then this pool was actually in a project, like a, you know, like a, a housing project. Mm. It's called Perry Homes. And, uh, and so the director of the pool was, uh, he was a black guy. His name was Eskia Bashir. And uh, he grew up swimming at Pittman Park, grew up in Mechanicsville. So we all kind of knew each other. Uh, the circle was pretty small. We all lived pretty close to Pittman Park, a couple miles away. And, um, and so he had about, at the time, I think he had about four kids and they were all like amazing swimmers. And um, he had it in his mind that he was going to start a swim team. And he started with his kids and just started pulling in other kids 
from the housing project. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, I was kind of sitting there and they're like, hey, do you want to come swim with us? And I was like, yes. And we all started together. So that group of kids was the seed that uh, eventually became the City of Atlanta Dolphins Swim Club. Oh, wow. um, and we grew to be one of the largest black swim clubs in the country. We had four or five different sites. We had, um, you know, coaches across each site. We had the largest city of Atlanta had the, the highest number of water safety instructor certified black uh, individuals in the country. Mm. So we were kind of like a powerhouse and eventually we, uh, you know, the parents started to join in. Um, the mayor of Atlanta, her daughters swam on the club, um, Shirley Franklin at the time. And so, we, we, you know, we had a lot of support from the community. We had a lot of support from the parents. And it ended up being this like really incredible bubble for black swimming uh, in the nation. And, I, you know, I grew up in that bubble. Um, you know, we were instilled with this notion of, um, you know, you can achieve your greatest dreams. Like we didn't even have proper swimsuits and our parents were like, they were giving us like this, um, this license to achieve our greatest dreams. Hey, you can make the Olympic team. There's nothing to stop you. And so it was that environment that really kind of fueled my entire career. Um, you know, I had one swim coach from call it age nine to 18. His name is Tommy Jackson. He was this year, he was inducted into the Georgia swimming hall of fame. Wow. Uh, and he was like a father figure for me, like every day, twice a day, we were together in the pool. And so I had, you know, I was lucky to have like one of the greatest uh, environments you can imagine for, for growing up as a black swimmer in this country. So from a near death experience to being part of this incredible team, uh, was it all black swimmers at the time? I would say 99%. Okay. Who, who was the white guy that was in there? His name is Jeff Earwood and he was awesome. <laughs> Jeff. Good for you, Jeff. That's awesome. <laughs> he was amazing. No, there were no, there were a number of other, like, you know, um, white kids, Asian kids, Latino. I mean, we, it, okay. it, uh, it ran the gamut. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So is there a stigma within the black community that, that stay away from water or are we afraid of water? Like you tell me your perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. It's one that like we really need to address. Right. So my, um, my thinking around this is that swimming is a generational skill Right. So by that, I mean, think about how'd you learn to cook an egg? Yeah, my mom. Your mom taught you, right? Yeah. So that's a generational skill, like one generation teaches the next. Mm. And so my belief is that that is what swimming is. Like, you know, my kids, I'll teach them to swim or mm. I'll make sure there's, you know, they learn to swim. It's a focus, it's part of our culture. And I think part of the stigma around swimming in the black community is the fact that there were 400 years in our history where um, swimming was not available. In fact, during slavery, that period of time, the slave owners did not want their slaves to know how to swim, mm -hmm. right? Because that that's another um, path to freedom. Mm. And so um, you know, you take away the generational aspect of the skill and you replace it with fear and, um, and, you know, that gestalt, if you will, kind of like leads us to this place where we are now, where, um, you know, many in the black community either don't know how to swim or are afraid of the water, um, and believe that, you know, believe that it's impossible for black people to know how to swim. And that's not just black people, but it's also white people. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was 12 years old, it was uh, the anniversary of Jesse Owens. Wait, was it Jesse Owens? It was the anniversary of, um, 
uh, was it not Jesse Owens? Anyway, it, there was an anniversary mm-hmm. of uh, breaking a color barrier. Mm-hmm. And uh, they got this guy, Al Campanis. And he was, a, he was a manager of the LA Dodgers at the time. And this was like 1984. And he said, um, you know, blacks are great athletes in sports like uh, football and track and baseball, but they would, they're not great in, at being quarterbacks and they're not, and they can never be swimming swimmers because their bodies are the wrong type of bodies for swimming. (laughs) Okay. Right. And I was like, and at the same time, like we had a whole like swim team of black kids. (laughs) So it was like, we were, this is on national television in 84. And I was, and, and so that at that moment it became real for me, even as a young kid that like, we had something to prove. Yeah. Um, and so to get back to your question, um, the lack of role models in the sport, um, the sport being taken away from us, um, you know, all kind of led to the stigma. And But I think it's changing. And, um, you know, communities across the country are adopting the sport of swimming. It's a movement. People like Maritza Cullen, Simone, Leah, Mm -hmm. Giles, um, Reese, they are um, exemplars of what is our potential and uh, people are taking note. Absolutely. Well, you know, like you said, you need, you need role models and you're certainly a role model for everybody. You came before all of them. So in terms of how did a a young black kid from Atlanta get to Stanford University, man. How how was that possible? Well, this is a great story. I'm so glad <laughs> I get to share it with you. Talk to me about this. So I was, you know, at a certain period in my career or in my life, like I got really confident. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you know, call it call it your teenage years, right? That teenage <laughs> confidence. And uh, and so I remember I was at home sitting on the couch or something eating cereal my dad comes home he's like Sabir uh, I got some tickets to the super show and I was like what's that dad he's like you know uh Emmett Smith and you know Scotty Pippen like they come and it's this big sporting goods event where all the sporting good retailers and like apparel companies they bring their athletes and Mm. it's a fan event and they sign autographs and all that and I was like ah not, not interested. He's like, I think that guy, uh, what, the guy you like, uh, Pablo Morales, mm. I think he's going to be there. And I was like, what? Let's go. <laughs> and so <laughs> as soon as I walk in the building, the first person I see is Pablo Morales signing <laughs> autographs. Nice. And I cut line. <laughs> I get up in front and I was like, Pablo, listen, listen to me. You got to listen to me. I'm going to break your record. I'm the best ever. Like you have to listen to me, Pablo. And I just like, it's like I blacked out and I was just talking. <laughs> and I was like, let me see your gold medal. And he didn't even have it on. Like it was nowhere in sight. Mm. And then after he signs every, he, had, he told me to wait. He's like, you need to wait. Cause we need to have a, like a longer conversation. <laughs> so he told me to wait. After that, he takes me to the side, right? And, and like, there's like this kind of corner area where not a lot of people. He reaches in his back pocket. Um, and uh, that's Cullen calling me right now. So I need oh, to talk to him. Nice. But uh, he, he reaches in his back pocket and uh, he pulls out his gold medal. Uh, and I was like, yes, there it is, Pablo. Thank you. You're my role <laughs> model, my hero. <laughs> Right. Cause like he, I'd seen him at the 92 Olympics, like, you know, it's all white guys and there's like tan guys, like what's this dude, like he's Uh, darker than everybody else. Like he wins, like, uh, and, um, and so he, I was, he was like, so you're going to break my record, huh? I was like, yeah, Pablo. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I'm trust me. I'm the guy. (laughs) 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 And, this is like 16 year old Sabir. And, uh, and so, you know, he shakes my hand, he takes my name down mm. and, uh, 
And then like, I just go back to my life of eating cereal and like, you know, <laughs> swimming. And like two months later, Skip Kenny, the head coach of Stanford, calls me. He's like, so I hear you're going to break Pablo's American record. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, beautiful. yep, believe it. <laughs> and so that's how Skip discovered me. Pablo gave Skip my name. Wow. And Skip called me out of the blue like I was not on his radar. And uh, and that kicked off the recruiting process. That's a cool um, story, man. Holy yeah. hell. That's yeah. that's awesome. But not only have you got to be a good swimmer to get in there, you got to be smart enough to get in there. So you must have been pretty good at school too, right? I mean, I was number one in my like high school class. I was a, I was a super nerd mm. in high school. Wow. Like I, I loved science. Um, yeah, it was like, I didn't have much of a social life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I spent all my time either reading books or comic books or like, you know, focused in on like, uh, grades and learning like is it because i you know honestly like i was looking for a ticket out brett you know what i mean like i didn't have like a comfortable upbringing i grew up in a rough neighborhood and so i saw all these opportunities educational athletic is like tickets wow yeah that's awesome. We're going to pivot just for a second. You did point at the comic books and I can see them. Now. <laughs> do you, you do you collect comic books? I at one point in my life yes, I was. I do I do uh, too. I collect some yeah. comics. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah, I don't anymore yeah. either. But yeah, no, yeah, it's like I can't do that stuff now. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, four ki- four kids. Yeah, yeah. That that's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too expensive. Like my four year old would destroy it. Like there's Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well that's awesome. Well listen, so then you, you do end up uh Stanford University. Did you did, did you uh, fit in there immediately? Or like how how was that? Uh so yeah, Stanford was a great place for me to land. So you say did I fit in there? I had like I had like two lives at Stanford. So one of the beautiful things about Stanford was they had these things called like themed dorms. Right. Okay. And so let's say, for example, if you were um, Native American, you grew up on a Native American like reservation and you wanted to be around other Native Americans, there was a dorm for you. Wow. S- same thing for Latinx. Right. And there was there was a black dorm called Ojama. Right. Okay. And I landed in Ujima. So it was like <laughs> everybody in the dorm with a few exceptions, like, of course it was diverse, but like you could opt in if you, mm. if that was your culture. And I opted in and had great experiences. Like people, my dorm class, people were like Sterling Brown. He's like a big time actor. Now he was like across the hall, his mm. wife, was literally across the hall for me he was down the hall and um and so it was just like this great environment it's like man this is so much fun i'm around people with si- similar backgrounds to the, to me but i'm also at stanford which is like the world's most inclusive place even at the, you know back in the 90s when i was there so it was a great environment for me now the the flip side of that is landing in the team right? The swim team, which is like, as you know, a college student, you spend so much time, that is really the culture that you, you end up spending yeah. uh, or experiencing. And I was welcomed. Like, um, you know, there were a few like exceptions, like, but that, that, that was primarily people who were threatened by my speed, mm. but I never felt threatened because that anybody was threatened because of my skin color or who I was like okay. it was it was just um I you know I had like incredible role models and friends and mentors on that team that really um laid the groundwork for me becoming the the person and the swimmer that I became awesome man um well, we we did swim around the same time in college oh, and yeah. and uh Al I, I don't know. Um, 
you know, when you're, when you're competing against teams, you have like these made up scenarios, you know? So like yeah. we, we just hated Stanford because you right. guys were just kind of like, you were just different from us, you know, like you're, <laughs> you're, you're smart and rich. And it was just like that, that was the persona, right. You know? Right. Yeah. So we just hated you guys, but I, I hated everybody on the team at Stanford except Sabia Muhammad. I couldn't hate you, man. I just I couldn't hate you. It was like, you were the nicest dude, you know? And you were like, you were tall and ripped and fit and fast and smiling all the time. It was just like, you can't hate this guy. He's just too good, you know? Yeah, man, I, uh, I, I really appreciate that, man. Uh, well, that I, and, and, I've, and I've always felt that way about you, believe it or not. Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, but you did come into Auburn in 98 and just tear us apart that year. I remember that. Well, I mean, you guys beat us the year before in we did. Minnesota. We did. We had, to, it, we had to do it that It was year. ugly. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Was that the blonde year? Night, the that, was year the, that was the first blonde year, yeah. So yeah. The, story, but the story behind the blonde is I came in from Australia in December and I had these blonde tips. Like I, my mom was a hairdresser. So she was always changing the color of my hair. So I come in and I've got these blonde tips and uh, kind of made an impact on the team straight away as a freshman. Um, I was, I was an older freshman. I was, I was 21 at the time. So I, I, I was more around the junior senior age. So I was kind of respected a little bit more than any freshman might be at that time. But I had these blonde tips. I come in and I'm flash and I'm, I'm a little bit like you, you know, I like to tell people how good I am and things like that. And uh, so it just, it just came to a decision that year of like, all right, we're going to, we're going to, everyone's going to get blonde, you know, it's cool. Let's let's do that. And so it definitely made an impact. And it was the first time a swim team had done something like that before. Cause I remember walking into the building and, and thinking to myself, everybody's done. Like they're all done. We're winning this thing just by the way people are looking at us, you know, Right. <laughs> but, uh, but that was 97, 98 was a different story. 98 was in Auburn. That was your senior year, I believe. And um, man, Stanford tore us to shreds that year. Yeah, that was a, it was a great year. We, I remember <clears throat> 97 Minnesota, I think it started there. Um, you guys were on the podium celebrating and, uh, and there, there's a guy, Scott Claypool on my team. He's like, everybody, we're not leaving. Let's just stand here and watch them celebrate. And that started the season. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> just, just watching you guys. Uh -huh. celebrate the, the other great thing that happened to me that year um or yeah that summer I had really not really hit my stride to be perfectly honest with you like <clears throat> I didn't have I didn't feel like I had the right group the right coach like you know I swam okay in 97 um and Skip he sits me down he's like listen we're gonna make some changes I hired a new coach he's gonna be the butterfly coach mm. I want you to go outside and meet him I walk outside and there's Pablo Morales. Oh, wow. So Pablo came on board, you know, the, the year before that final year that led to that championship. And it made all the difference for me. Now, is that when you actually broke his record? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Did he, did he, <laughs> did he put that in your head? Like we're, we're getting this together. Like, did he, is this something yeah. he wanted for you? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's an awesome story. It, it was incredible, dude. I could like, you can't make this stuff up. Like wow. a mouthy 16 year old kid mm. talking about how he's going to break his, his like role models record, mm. his role model coming, like joining forces with him, becoming like the best friend in this process. Like it was like a training montage. It was like Rocky and like his trainers. That's what <laughs> Pablo was for me. Like every wow. day leading up to that championship at Auburn. What did he do for you? Like what, what, what are the changes he made that led to you swimming that American record? He just brought it all the way down for me, man. Like, and I think that's, you know, every, everybody like thrives under a different type of personality. Mm. And, you know, Dave, Dave Marsh is one of these type. Of, he's one of these types of personalities that they're, they're like these, like, I call them the constant gardener type personalities. Like they just keep it really cool. They never get up. They're, you're, never, you're never up, way up, never way down. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's right there. Yep. You know what I mean? 
And so that's what prob, you know, Pablo brought. Like Skip was an incredible, um, like incredibly inspirational, but he was also kind of like moody and all over the place. Like he mm-hmm. was always trying to motivate you and find ways to motivate you. Whereas Pablo is like, it was just, he, he was just like, he was, he was the wavelength. Mm. That, and you just needed to tap into that and like everything else kind of took care of itself. So it was really incredible to have him as a coach during wow. that time. Yeah. That's fantastic, man. I love it. Are you, you two still pretty close to this day? Whenever I see him, I have to hug him. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's way out in Nebraska. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's been a while since we spoke, probably a couple of years. That's awesome. So you have this success in 98. Um, part of what I do is I, I, I do talk to a lot of Olympic athletes. Tell me about your Olympic experience in terms right. of not making it. Like why? Right. For, for me, when I think of Sabir Muhammad, I mean, at that time, you're you're the guy i mean you, you could right. do everything you were incredible um so so what happened like why didn't you make the olympic team you think yeah i think i think um there are a number of different factors right um i think i think you have to find your you know kind of your ideal training environment yeah and there's two there's two two parts of that Stanford was a great program for short course swimmers college swimming basically yeah college swimming yeah um but if you if you kind of look at like that period of time dial back and look at like kind of the long course performance or olympic Mm -hmm. performance it was different like skip kenny sometimes didn't even coach summers because he's in his yeah, he sent his co- he sent he sent his kids down to like Santa Clara and like you know, so it's like I never really kind of found that like ideal program, yeah, um, which was a challenge uh, for me. And even after I graduated Stanford, I wanted to stay and train with um, Richard Quick because I trained with Richard the summer the 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 season after we won in '98. I trained mm-hmm. with Richard Quick. I made the Pan Am Games team. Yeah, I made the Pan Am Games team and uh, was like hitting a nice stride with Richard. And um, Richard calls me one day uh, because I plan to stay at, at Stanford and train under him going into the Olympics. And he called me the summer of 98 after I made the Pan Am Games team. He's like, listen, you can't stay. I was like, what? Like, I just want a championship. Like, he's like, no, I can't. I can't coach you um and so was that I a had skip, and, skip and skip and, and yeah richard that was problem? yeah yeah that was that was a skip and richard problem mm. and so <clears throat> i had to find another place to to sit you know to train and prepare for 2000 so that kind of contributed to it yeah uh long story short i you know i didn't make the olympic team but i feel like i had an incredible run and it's you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but not making that team gave me a lot of fuel that has fueled the rest of my career. And, uh, you know, I think if I had a slow down, ha- having made an Olympic team and made it, I wouldn't be where I am today professionally. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think all failures are catalysts for future successes for sure. Um, how close did you get? I can't remember exactly. In so I I uh, did. I went to three Olympic trials. Ninety six, it was a disaster. Two thousand, I was eighth uh, in the hundred free, and then in two thousand four, I got fourth in the fifty, okay. and eighth in the hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty close. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And during this time after college, what are you doing for money? How are you surviving? Uh, so yeah, another good question, right? So it's like, how, how does a guy support himself on Olympic dream in that era? 
Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> 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 so I got lucky. I got accepted to this. Uh, at the time, there's a USA national resident program training under John T. Skinner. Mm. And uh, I moved to Colorado Springs, lived on campus, ate on campus at the Olympic Training Center and lived and trained there. And then I got a small speedo deal um, that following year, which like it's the first time I ever had money in my pocket, which was amazing. <laughs> Were you the first black swimmer signed by speedo? Uh, you know what? I think I was. Yeah. I can't. I mean... I can't think of others, but maybe they were. But yeah, that, that's that's pretty cool. Again, you're paving the way for these future big signings that are coming up now. The, that's you know, right. Simone's on probably. Uh, Simone is Speedo? She's a, a tier. A tier, she's tier. I bet uh, Cullen's Speedo, right? Cullen, uh, Cullen was Speedo. He actually works with Speedo now. Oh, okay. Cullen yeah. took your money. You got to get some of that from him. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Good. That's awesome. So, so well, well, tell me about this then. How, how have you felt a responsibility to your community, to the black community? How yeah. have you stayed connected with that throughout the years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in 2000, <clears throat> what is it? 2009 launched a swim school here in Atlanta. Okay. And, uh, and we launched it with, really, with a really specific mission. And that was to make sure that we could teach kids of all backgrounds to learn to swim and it, with a, a, a focus on kids from the communities I grew up in. Yep. And so uh, we had an interesting model. It was like for every four paying students, we offered one scholarship and, uh, and you know, call it for the past 11 years we've been teaching kids you know i've taught hundreds of kids myself um in metro atlanta to to learn to swim and uh and so that's been like kind of one way i've contributed and the other way is just you know um speaking engagements mentorship with athletes uh elite athletes all the way down to you know age groupers and uh, and now you know it's more formalized. We have Team Black, uh, which was just uh, organized over the summer. People like um, Cullen, Maritza, Tony, uh, you you know you know the mm -hmm. cohort. Yep. Um, and so we are organizing our efforts to be more focused in our influence on the sport. From um an outside perspective like a, a white guy let's say you know when i look at sports around america they're uh dominated by black athletes generally mm -hmm. most of them and and when you you just mentioned some of those names i think of s some incredible athletes you know so yeah. how do we get it to a point where um there are more black swimmers and more dominant black swimmers uh in in our mm -hmm. sport yeah um, so that, the, that's absolutely our mission, right? Um, so, you know, when you talk to someone like Simone, she has a very different background than me. You know, she grew up swimming on an all white club. Yeah. She, she experienced racism from her peers. Like her peers didn't invite her to parties and that uh -huh. sort of thing. Like that's a, that's a super um tough environment to thrive in yeah she thrived because she had a strong family setting her mom didn't let her quit but for many um an athlete that are growing up in that type of environment it's not worth it especially when there are so many other sports available to great athletes mm -hmm. like yeah. i could have easily been a basketball player or, sure. you know i'm six eight like i could have figured it out and been okay Mm -hmm. gotten a college scholarship i was offered one when i was 13 mm. um but <clears throat> you know our mission is to find ways to grow these pockets of black swimmers yeah. so it could be age group swimmers uh mentorship for those those swimmers that are on white clubs but just don't feel like they're accepted talking mm -hmm. to the coaches on those teams 
letting them know that they have to um, be color conscious when it comes to uh, African Americans in our sport, black people, people of color in our sport, because you can't be colorblind in this day and age. Like it doesn't work. You have to be color conscious. So we, you know, we have grassroots um, programs that we are working with USA Swimming uh, as a, as a body to support as well as supporting in areas like social media, uh, supporting in areas like cataloging the history of African-Americans in the sport. Like you just mentioned another um, um, like accolade that I, I need to go and research is probably either me or Byron, who is a good friend who's, who, who performed my wedding, Byron, Davis, mm-hmm. um, who's an incredible <clears throat> swimmer at the time. And so um, all of these, you know, there's so many different um, factors that can impact uh, a young swimmer and, and help them keep in the sport when they're good versus switching out of the sport. Um, and so we're working with USA Swimming. We're working directly with um, – programs across the country in terms of a mentorship um, apparatus and, uh, and, and just being, making ourselves available, especially in light of, you know, all of the social change that's happening in our country now. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, it, we are, we're more focused on it as, as well and want change. Awesome. Awesome. Um, are, are you guys being supported by you know usa swimming and other agencies like that yeah so the support is really just like they are turning to us for advice okay um and and uh and acting on it so we we are you know we're essentially supporting usa swimming at this point in time i wouldn't say there's any type of financial arrangements or anything formal from that perspective uh but you know we are a body of you know, elite swimmers who've done it, know what it takes to do it and know what the change it is required of USA swimming for them to really embrace, um, black swimmers. And you mentioned something very significant. You said you see blacks dominating all the sports in this country, but what's happening in the sport of swimming. Oh, it's incredible. The, I think the, we don't have the exact numbers, but like call it 1%. Yeah. Or less in USA Swimming's cohorts. Mm-hmm. But we are producing elite athletes. Simone, Leah, Colin, like, mm-hmm. yep. you know, incredible. So there is something there in terms of the numbers. Like, if sure. we can bring more numbers into this sport, we, we are going to continue to see some incredible athletes pop up in some seriously fast times um and it's kind of like a hidden a hidden figure like okay oh african americans black people they don't swim and like they're not well represented it but if you look at their performance it's mind-blowing and so it seems like it's just a numbers game we get more into the sport and we'll continue to see more you know uh exciting swims yeah there's, there's yeah. no doubt about it in my mind man <laughs> yeah <laughs> speaking of uh talent uh i know you've got some some kids of your own that have some talent talk to me about them uh you my, well my most talented athlete is the four-year-old okay. her name is sahar yeah she's uh nice. she doesn't do a sport yet but she just blows us away with her athletic ability every day oh, nice. so everybody's like focused on sahar all right, everybody. Um, everybody's got about, uh, <laughs> about twelve years to to get recruiting on that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're, it's not it's not set what sport she'll be, uh, but uh, she she loves to swim. So and I've so I've got an eight year old or sorry a ten nine year old now mm-hmm. who's a swimmer. Yep. Um, she is she's the type that her name is June. She's the type she gets home and I say, hey, how was practice? And she's like, ah, don't worry about it, Dad. Like she just doesn't want me and her business okay um she's going to be fantastic at whatever she does i'm just happy that she goes to swim twice a week sometimes once a week that's okay um and then there's cabal cabal just committed to uva 
uh, to swim up there. Wow. He's actually he's at the U.S. Open this weekend. Well, fantastic. Um, What's his events? So he swim. He's unlike his dad. He can swim everything. Oh. Yeah, I can swim breaststroke. He can swim two hundred free. Swim hundred fly. Two hundred am. It's a good pickup for uh, UVA then. Yeah, yeah. It's like super, super versatile and uh, confident. The guy's confident. Why did he not want to follow in his dad's footsteps and go to Stanford? I think you know, you know, I, I definitely wanted. I was pushing him towards Stanford, right? Uh-huh. I think sometimes there's too much pressure on a kid. Yeah. You know, yep. from the standpoint of like, oh my, you know, your dad did this, and don't you want to follow his footsteps? Like, this generation of kids, they don't need the extra pressure. They need yep. to be themselves. They need yep. to, you know, chart their own path. And so, uh, I'm, I'm excited. I think you have UVA has one of the best coaches in the country, uh-huh. and uh, like on the women's side, like I think they were expected to win this year. Yeah. I think after picking up Kamal and a few other recruits, like they're going to be dangerous on the men's side too. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's, they will establish their own legacy very, very uh, shortly. Absolutely, here. absolutely. Good choice, actually. A very good choice. And then your eldest. Yeah, my oldest son's a basketball player. Okay. Uh, and so he is uh, he is finishing up his junior college career, and he will be going to a place like UGA or University of Florida to play basketball uh, next year. So okay. he has aspirations of being a professional. Oh, wow. How tall is he? He's about 6'9". He's like oh, 240. He's, he's incredible. He's oh, a jumper. My. Oh, uh, he can he can push that around now. That's good. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about you in your life now? Where are you at? What are you doing? I'm a technology executive. Uh, I work in um, kind of uh, the advertising technology space, if you will. Uh, I've been in this space for about seven years, and uh, it's it's interesting. I love it. It's challenging. It's complex. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my day job. Awesome. Yeah. Day job. And then chasing kids around. That's chasing awesome. kids at night. Yep. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, listen, um, you've always been an inspiration to me. Great leader within your own community and, um, just a good dude. I, I love, I love you, man. You're a, you're a good person. So yeah, I feel the same way about you, Mr. Hawk. Always smiling, man. I love to smile, but, um, no, the community is very lucky to have you, and I'm and I'm glad. You know, I'm I'm hoping we can we can get a lot more black athletes into our sport uh, at the highest level because, um, man, I I had uh, a situation where I was coaching Ariana Vanderpool Wallace for a while there, and she was just one of the most um, talented uh, athletes I've ever had. But you know what she had? She had the talent, and the work ethic. She, she had a chip on her shoulder, you know, right. when you get, when you get those athletes with the chip on the shoulder, they do incredible things. Um, yeah. she was, she was so fun to work with and, 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 um, yeah, we, we need more, more like that, man, a lot more like that. So couldn't agree with you more. All right. Appreciate your time, buddy. All right. Good to see you again. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. Yeah. Take care. Thanks a bit. Bye. All right. Bye.